Hello, and welcome to this lecture on the Occupancy Manifesto. This is a lecture that's happening under the theme of pluriversality. It seems appropriate since it's work born from the research my wife, a philosopher, and I, an architect, produced during a pandemic that has managed to lay bare the threads that connect intellectual and pragmatic divides. This lecture is, in turn, tied to its sister presentation on the Hyperbaroque, which my wife will present in a couple of days at this same event. I encourage you to attend both to draw further conclusions. That said, with such an abundance of information in the world and how this paradoxically seems to make the acquisition of knowledge harder, you as an audience have to ask yourselves in attending a lecture whether it is going to be relevant and applicable to your interests. So I'll kick off by drawing a clear outline of what this one's about. The main theme of this talk is architecture. We'll cover some basic notions of use and form and how these are used to conceive, describe, teach, and even regulate design. And then I'll explain why we're doing this all wrong. True to its name, the lecture will present a manifesto. It is not a theory, that looks back on phenomena to posit explanations or a set of lineaments to understand it. It is a statement that is prospective and speculative of what we think the shape of things to come may be. I also openly invite everyone to use the Q and A's at the end to challenge and provoke everything I say today. I expect this lecture to furnish you with a trained eye with which to look at and assess architecture and a new measuring stick through which to gauge and express how buildings are evolving around you, especially in a world forced to transformation by COVID-19. Before we begin, I want to add a quick question, a quick word on the importance of taxonomy or the systems we choose to classify and create categories around things. You may be acquainted with Borges's Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge where he demonstrates how all attempts at classification are ultimately arbitrary. In the story, he presents a land in which the most important category to group animals in is whether or not they belong to the emperor, biology be damned. This won't be too far off. The Occupancy Manifesto is simply an alternative system of measurement. As someone living in a country that, still, that is still cursed with the use of inches and ounces and acres, this is an argument for convenience rather than a pursuit of truth. Because this is meant to be a 90 minute lecture, I want to make sure the most important part catches you while you're still fresh. So we're going to begin with a conclusion and then make our way back up to the explanation. We'll start off with a description of our argument and break it down into more detail to then take a look at what the manifesto actually consists of. After this, we'll take a little break for you to mull over some things and then return to go over some case studies before turning over to Q and A's. I will be structuring the explanation of our argument throughout each section with these four recurring questions. How are we doing things? Meaning, what is the current state of affairs? Why are we doing things wrong? Pointing out the flaws inherent to the system. Why is this a problem? In which I'll explain why doing things wrong generates very real problems, calling us to action. And how can we make things better? Where I'll be referring to the specific solutions provided in this manifesto. So, how are things right now? We're going to start slow and then pick up. Remember, this is just a rundown of our argument. So when we think of a building, we part from two preconceptions, its form and its use. Said otherwise, what shape do I associate to the building when I look at it? And what activity do I associate with the building when I think about what takes place inside it? Let's make this a little more clear by using a soccer stadium as an example. When we close our eyes and picture one in our minds, we conceive of an egg-shaped form related to an activity, a soccer match, said form encapsulates. This combination pretty much sums up our immediate 
most direct understanding of a stadium. The same works uh, can be said for any other major type of building, a church, a school, or whatever. So if you want to build a stadium, you hire an architect to design it. However, even though both form and use are essential to the stadium as we understand it, the architect's main concern will be its form. This is the core of his profession. An architect's only deliverable for his professional services rendered is a set of drawings, which will serve as an instructions manual on how to build the form that's been designed. Now, I have no intention of underestimating or undermining the value of form. Form, when well-conceived, bears the responsibility of being aesthetically pleasing and functional, structurally robust, and com compliant with urban parameters. Use is also not absent in the architect's engagement. Designing the user's experience is something an architect can do, but it's too often seen as a sort of added value. Look around you. The vast majority of everything designed by architects today is not more than aesthetic, functional, structurally robust, and code compliant form. Architectural engagement on the level of use is relegated to the very bold, the very fringe, or some of the more academic bubbles of the profession, and is usually a more comfortable fit in sales pitches and books than in actual buildings. To drive this point home, Imagine having to design a dozen stadiums, which is something that actually happens every four years because of the World Cup. When the government of Russia or any host country commissions new or renovated designs, an architect knows his purpose is to achieve a unique form above anything else. Could you imagine the embarrassment of commissioning a dozen stadiums and having them all look the same? However, there will be no qualms whatsoever in having all of these stadiums used or occupied in the exact same way. One would probably reserve the bigger one for the opening or closing matches, and that's it. No one expects spectator experience to be unique, only form. That's why if we go back to our construct of the stadium, we find that an architect's job steers much more towards making form hyper-specific while keeping use hyper-generic. Having laid this out, we have to ask ourselves, why is this wrong? Isn't it normal for the scope of any profession to value some things above others? What makes me raise a first flag as an architect myself is that from the user's point of view, the only real manner of experiencing a building is through use. In other words, you need to occupy architecture in order to experience and appreciate it as such. However, to design that experience, which requires the ability to project yourself into the eyes of the user who is inside your building, from client to maintenance staff, and how the building is seen in good or bad weather, alone or in a crowd, on the day of its inauguration or 10 years later, that alternative outlook is often accessory, sometimes an afterthought of the design process. If you don't believe me, take a look at how we architects choose to freely represent our work. We use aerial views showing perspectives that no one will see. We share plans, elevations, and construction documents, which are drafted for builders, not for users. We use scale models, the more abstract, the better to humor the inane conceit that a building could or should be perceived in one bite and not through the actual irrepla irre irreplaceable experience of occupying it. In Peru, the country I worked in, national awards for architectural achievement are often given by jurors who have never visited the buildings they are judging. This is a reflection of how normal it has become for architects to confuse the experience of seeing buildings as represented in image with the experience of the buildings themselves. All too content to pursue a unique image and being very proud of the World Cup stadium we designed that looks nothing like the one next to it in the Panini sticker album, we use our dominance of the image we've designed 
as a stepping stone towards designing use, which leads to the mistaken belief that the achievement of a unique image automatically implies the achievement of a unique user experience. And in general terms, we find this is enough to dispel any qualms we may have about being too self-absorbed. We know that in designing a unique form, we will be providing users with a unique experience of admiring that form. In other words, because our stadium has an unprecedented form, then the experience of going under or through that form must itself be unprecedented. We count on users feeling that the stadium is cool because the form we have produced for them is cool. And this is a shortcut we take to believe that we actually engage in user experience. Now then, one thing is to point out this fallacy, the shortcut we create to collapse unique image into, into unique use. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, pro mean it's a problem, yeah, does it? The fact that this has become normal in contemporary architecture does not mean that it will withstand the acid test that is COVID-19. The puzzle piece that doesn't fit is the obvious realization that forms and uses have historically diverged from each other. In buildings, uses, always, uh, uses have always appropriated forms, from the Roman basilica, which took on the form of what was a marketplace, to neoclassicism, where every building, regardless of use, took on the form of an ancient temple. In past decades, however, this divergence has accelerated to the point where uses have become collectivized or virtualized far beyond any formal considerations. Take Airbnb, for instance. The largest hotel in the world doesn't even have an architectural form it can be associated with. Given this context, the pandemic is forcing our buildings to revise their use even further in ways much closer to everyday life. Now that our homes are our offices, can we really picture the form that a home should have? Let's return quickly to our stadium. If its current expression has cardboard cutouts in lieu of spectators, does it still need its current form? It could be reduced in size to occupy a fraction of its footprint, make it entirely different. If it is just a stage for a performance to be broadcast, then the evolution of the stadium might well bring it closer to that of a television studio. What will drive new form, the new form of our buildings, is how they will be occupied, especially through a pandemic in which occupation is the default metric for health and safety. And this brings us to our last question. How can we make things better? Or how can we change the way we see architecture so that it is more helpful in understanding the wave of rapid mutation it is going through? This is where our manifesto comes in. If instead of form, we used occupancy as a main category to understand Sorry. What if instead of form, we used occupancy as the main category to understand buildings with? Let's take a look at what, that look, at what this would look like. This is a list of five different building types. Our trusted uh, soccer stadium, a racetrack, a movie theater, an office building, and a residential building. If we were to connect them today in our minds, we would probably relate to the office and residential buildings because we imagine both as having the form of a tower. Similarly, we would link the stadium and the racetrack since they're both sort of egg-shaped with a hollow center. However, if we retrain ourselves to look at occupancy before form, we would see the residential and office towers are almost opposite. One holds people for about eight hours, mostly during the day, while the other one is occupied throughout the whole day, but mostly at night, if adults are working and children are at school during the day. The soccer stadium and the racetrack, which seemed so similar as to believe the architect who designed one might be qualified to design the other, are not so similar anymore. 
an average spectator stays three times longer at the racetracks than at the stadium. The movie theater emerges as a stadium's unsuspected closer relative, since it entails people sitting down for roughly the same amount of time at around the same time of the day. Do you remember how, in 2008, scientists announced that the Tyrannosaurus rex was more closely related to a chicken than to any other reptile, even other dinosaurs? Well, our occupancy manifesto does just that by revealing connections which are less immediately apparent in a way that can be more useful to us today. That is a general argument. I hope you're all able to follow me in this train of thought. Now, before we go into more detail, and also to take a little break, we're going to shift gears and define a couple of key terms which will be very useful to obtain a common view. Let's start by defining architecture. This may sound overly ambitious, and I'm pretty aware one could spend a lifetime debating the question. This exercise is just for the sake of building an argument. The definition I will give is the one most true to me as a practicing architect, but I am open to discussing it with anyone outside the confines of this lecture. So, to me, architecture has three components. One, it is man-made. One could occupy, say, an animal's den or a natural shelter in the forest, like a hollow tree, but for it to be more than a shelter, it has to have been made by humans. In other words, architecture is not spontaneous. It is a product of effort. Two, it has to be intentional. I like to use the cave as an example. A simple cave would not be considered architecture because, according to the first point, it is not man-made. However, if we were to make an exact replica of the cave, imitating it to its last atom, then that replica would be architecture, even if it is indistinguishable from the original, because the replica would be intentional. And number three, the third and final characteristic is that architecture must create a threshold, a boundary between two spaces. This is usually an inside and out, but there are variations. Let's imagine a pyramid in the desert. If it is not separating two spaces, to me, it's a giant sculpture, a sculpture of architectural proportions, if it pleases you. But the minute in which the pyramid has an interior chamber, I consider it as architecture. Now let's proceed with a second definition, morphology. So far, we've been talking about image and form, but the proper term to systematically approach variations in form is morphology. This is by no means limited to architecture. This image that you're seeing, for example, shows cubipods, which are used to build naval piers. However, at a different scale, one could be forgiven for believing they are a catalog of building shapes. So let's go back to a detailed breakdown of our argument. When we look back and think about why we tend to relate form to use, we need look no further than the modernist movement, which took place in the 20th century, roughly after the First World War and advocated for the abandonment of previous styles and the embrace of new forms of architecture and urbanism that prized efficiency and the technological advances of the times, from construction materials to automobiles. In 1952, the Eighth International Congress of Modernist Architecture, Siam, built, uh, produced this excerpt, which I'll read for you. They say, if we want to give our cities some definite form, we will have to classify them by sectors. When a city is replanned, it is divided into zones of different land uses, industrial, commercial, business, residential, etc. The resulting pattern should then be organic and different from the shapeless growth we have today. So you notice how formlessness is seen as detrimental to the city and use is championed as the right classification to determine form? Does this sound familiar? 
I won't argue that form, now morphology, and use are unrelated, but the relation is selective. Form does follow use when driven by tradition, as with a church needing to look like a church. Function, like a stadium or a theater, having to maximize spectator visibility. Or economy, like a real estate development project that will usually seek regular forms to maximize profit. However, these associations are circumstantial, not substantial. To provide an easy example, if we relate church to the form of a church and its use for, say, getting married, we can conceive of the same wedding taking place in a gazebo that has a completely different morphology to a church. As much as we can conceive of the church being used for many things other than a religious event. In this case, for contrast, I chose a rave by none other than a man who calls himself DJ Hell. As you can imagine, this was slightly controversial when it happened in Melbourne. In practice, morphology and use are only sometimes aligned. This is something that has been well studied, especially since the twilight of modernism around 1972. Delirious New York from 1978, a book that's very celebrated in the architecture community and also a manifesto, argues that the quid of Manhattan is not the shape of its building, but of, the, of its buildings, but the episodic nature of the activities that take place inside them. This rings especially true today. With the advent of co-working, office tower developments try harder and harder to appear domestic. Even before the pandemics, our homes were increasingly being used as home offices. Our hotels try to be both, a place where you can live and a place where you can work. And amidst all of this, the, skys the skyscraper, so closely linked to all of these programs, now belongs to none. We probably all know the Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world, but do we all know what, it, what is inside it? I am an architect and I had to Google it. The underlying question is, here is, does anybody care? Morphology doesn't need use to explain itself. So let's revisit why it's a mistake for architects to be so overly concerned with form instead of actual usage. While I've mentioned how important it is for, our, for architects to produce unique forms, I must underline that this has become a matter of professional necessity more than one of personal choice. Architects are hired for their ability to produce uniqueness, not sameness. Think about how any other professional specialist, when hired, is expected to repeat a honed skill. A surgeon is expected to perform the same perfect surgery. A pilot is expected to fly the exact same route. The perfect commercial airline pilot is not Tom Cruise and Top Gun, but the exact opposite. A pilot who will not improvise and who will, who will execute the same flight he has completed many times before. By contrast, an architect would not be doing his job well if he designed the same building twice. This is a reason why plagiarism is so fiercely condemned by the architectural community. An architect can have repetitive style, sure, but the form within that style must be unique. This leads us to a phenomenon I like to call the finite form anxiety. If architects repeatedly use regular forms, it's only a matter of time before their buildings start looking alike. It's like a world in which only pop music existed. Past a certain point, every number one hit will sound familiar, as many indeed do. It's no surprise then that, aided by technology, morphology in contemporary architecture has taken a radical swerve towards the complex. Right angles limited the ability to conceive unique forms. One can see how, at the end of modernism, housing blocks started looking inbred. Had modernism not lost steam, I can assure you architecture would be undergoing a different sort of crisis of originality and authorship. 
Now you may wonder why this wasn't a problem before modernism. The major difference was that architecture did not pursue unique forms with the zeal it does today. The repetition of floor plans was not only accepted, but a must to fit in with the current styles. That's why you can find so many floor plans in common between Gothic cathedrals, Renaissance palaces, and even colonial churches in Latin America. This doesn't mean that formal differentiation was irrelevant, just that it wasn't nearly as strong a driver as it is today. My wife and I got married in the Church of San Pedro in Lima, which was fashioned from the plants of the Church of Il Gesù in Rome, built 58 years prior. Perhaps the key factor to explain this radical drive for unique form is a prominent role of authorship in architecture. This, of course, is tied to the commercial role of architects who need to offer differentiation to establish a commercial value for their work. If an architect is charging you an exorbitant amount to produce a design, it better be unique, right? The acceptance of repetition in the top tier architecture market would immediately destroy the business model of design oriented architecture firms. And for better or worse, this is, a build, this is a business model that's perpetuated in architecture schools. Architecture is taught as a highly individualistic career where students prepare their studio work at the expense of more work and less sleep, encouraged to come out on top by presenting the best possible form for a common studio objective. Rather than being time, top management, time management skills or how to delegate, they are taught to pursue competition and differentiation above anything else. This would all be untenable through orthogonal morphology. Every work done would eventually have a precedent showing why it failed or how it could be done better. By opening morphology up to complexity, architects escape the trap of finite geometry and regain the possibility of producing unique forms even if by doing so, they subscribe to a Faustian pact that pushes them to generate unique experience through unique images alone. Now, this is a point in which we could argue that, you know, sure, okay, this probably happens, but I fail to see why it's a problem for anyone except academics. After all, 90% of our everyday lives occur with us using architecture, without actually having to think about it. So let's out, outline three reasons why this is a problem, starting with the most intellectual and ending with the most practical. First is the ontological argument. Take this as a thought experiment. If a building isn't occupied, should it still be considered architecture? This is why it was important to define architecture earlier. For the sake of this argument, we had defined architecture as a man-made intentional threshold. If these three characteristics exist only because of human perception, has architecture lost its substance if you take them away? This is similar to the thought experiment that questions if a tree makes noise if it falls down with no one to hear it. As practicing architects, we tend to imagine spaces as if they were ideally occupied. We don't usually think of buildings as empty or overcrowded, of the night shift lobby at 3 a.m. or the long lines at the supermarket during rush hour. In presenting this ontological question, I wish to challenge, I wish to challenge how we think of the relationship between architectural design and user perception. Our second argument reads, if architects don't prioritize occupancy, others will. I'll tie this down with an example from the world of corporate interiors. One of the points of inflection in the history of office design came in 1968 with the design of the cubicle. It completely revolutionized the office space, which up until then adhered to the Fordian principles of the assembly line. Today, the company's most set on understanding how people work, what motivates them, what makes them most comfortable, and ultimately more productive, are furniture companies 
not architects. Sure, they will collaborate with architects because they need them on their side. But between us, if a client were to ask any leading furniture company to design their office, they would be more than capable of doing so. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not arguing that all architects are overly obsessed with the forms of their buildings and completely disregard how they're experienced. I'm aware and appreciative of architecture that puts use and occupancy first. What I do argue is that it's so hard for architects to not put form first. One of the most famous projects themed on the enhancement of human experience is Bernard Schumi's Parc de la Villette. The whole project is based on designing flexible space for people to use freely. And yet to do so, Schumi relies on folies, the wacky shapes meant to embody an argument for situationism which, when push comes to shove, are formal constructs much more than interactive platforms. I dare you to Google them and to find them being actually used as intended. On the contrary, they are fetishized because of their geometry and coloring. They are often depicted in plan views or isometries, or with Photoshop black and white backgrounds, leaving only the red coloring. Even these icons of user experience are more celebrated for their form. Naturally, architects do think about user experience, but it doesn't compare to the ingrained notion that good architecture is the good design of a unique form. A good designer does not compromise form, but is all too indifferent to caricaturing use. That's why it's so easy to Photoshop how buildings are occupied in our renderings. If it's a public space in a relatively progressive society, throw in a street vendor, some juggling hippies, and you're done. A real estate project? Photoshop a blue sky, trees, a happy family of four, and you're done. We find it way too easy to gloss over occupation. When we design a cemetery, we don't think about how it will look like if it's over or undercrowded. We come up with just the right amount of people so that our image looks good. But think of an overcrowded cemetery. Could that image lead to good design? Wouldn't that change the form we're about to design? Or should we just let the plant grow to the size of the pot and let the managers figure out, figure out how many people should be allowed in at once? We are all too happy to wash our hands off a key factor in how our spaces are experienced. And it will come as no surprise to me if architecture keeps on losing territory to other disciplines, other disciplines that understand experience is the most important driver of design. A polite fiction exists between architects and furniture manufacturers or real estate developers who could probably do what architects, are, what architects do given the chance. But what's alarming is how we can now see architecture without architects in video games, in movies, and very soon in virtual reality. And throughout all of this, we are still preoccupied with giving the real world another unique form. Finally, this might be the most relevant reason outside architecture for people to mull over these concerns. Building codes and safety regulations have to co-evolve with buildings. We see, it, we see it constantly. Fire codes are updated and improved. Sustainability regulations become more demanding. Density is regularly based on urban capacity. However, if we cling to form, we're not helping these regulations adapt. Going back to our stadium as an example, a safety code will likely determine the amount of exits per spectator. However, if a future stadium becomes virtual, imagine the seats being replaced by monitors with people projecting themselves in real time from their homes, thus bypassing any safety concern, how would that affect the regulation? A review committee would probably have to sit down and think through it. And the, at and the outcome would, have, to, would uh, have the fire marshal asking, well, how many people will actually be there and for how long? And the architect will point the finger to the stadium owner or the facilities manager, who will explain how many people actually occupy the space. 
Hence, the definition of safety measures will fall outside the purview of architects, and architects will have allowed it. Take it one step further. The stadium is now being used for classrooms, as has been the case in Denmark. Just like a few days ago, SpaceX started, using, uh, started hosting classes for employee children in its rocket factories. Safety codes are going to be directly based on these shifting uses. So whether architects want it or not, how people occupy space will become a determining factor in how buildings are regulated. And so we finally reach the million dollar question. How can we make, how can we do it better? By shifting the focus from the formal to reclaim occupancy as a driving force for architectural design. If the architect's estrangement from engaging use to prioritizing form weren't enough, today's public health crisis demands that we question whether or not we are using the correct measuring stick when approaching design. The Occupancy Manifesto does not advocate to remove or belittle form or the pursuit of unique forms. As an architect, I enjoy the value this morphological stimulus uh, and, and value this morphological stimulus as much as anyone. And I deeply acknowledge the skill needed to create compelling and beautiful forms. What the Occupancy Manifesto does insist on, however, is that architectural design should incorporate the patterns of behavior of its occupants at its inception rather than as an afterthought. Now we're going to switch gears again and talk about the actual manifesto. We had already spoken about the role of taxonomy, Borges's animal, animal categories of belonging or not to the emperor, the T-Rex being more closely related to the chicken than to the Triceratops. And finally, how I argue that, if seen from the perspective of occupancy rather than morphology, a soccer stadium is much closer to a movie theater than to a racetrack, despite them having clearly different forms. So in order to create our new taxonomy, we'll use a simple two-dimensional Cartesian grid in which our main axes will be vertically crowd size, and horizontally uh, permanence. The first refers to the number of people that can be simultaneously found inside the building, while the second refers to how long that crowd will stay there. Let's go back to the three building types we are familiarized with at this point, the stadium, the racetrack, and the movie theater. Since they come in different sizes, we'll refer to specific examples when mapping them. For the stadium, we'll take the Bernabeu in Madrid, which is of a standard large size and is in a city to which soccer matters. We'll map it here under point one, under the coordinates 2.581,000, which means the crowd size will be 81,000, the stadium seating capacity, and the duration of the stay will be roughly 2.5 hours, the length of a soccer match plus some wiggle time before and after. At this point, bear in mind that we are still talking about the system of mapping, not the precision of the mapping points. So if we're thinking about you know, what happens if the soccer match goes into penalties, we'll go into that later. For the racetrack, we'll use Santa Anita Park in Los Angeles. We'll place a point further to the left under the coordinates 5.5 and 85K. You'll notice its Y value is very similar to that of the stadium, since both buildings share a similar seating capacity. But the X value for permanence varies. After all, one visits a stadium just to see a soccer match, but you can spend a full afternoon at the races. Last but not least, we have the movie theater. To use a case closer to our current circumstance, we'll take the Lighthouse 5 in Florida, which is the country's largest drive-in movie venue. Its point will be located almost directly underneath that of the stadium, under the coordinates 2.25, 1.2K, as it roughly shares the same X value for permanence, as a movie <clears throat> and soccer matches are fairly similar in length, but not the Y value for crowd size. 
this movie theater holds a fraction of the crowd in the stadium. By mapping buildings in this way, we can see how they relate to each other more clearly. The stadium and the racetracks share the same crowd size, but the stadium and the movie theater share the same permanence. This method of mapping also allows us to identify the occupancy range of building types. If we just focus on the soccer stadium and we map five different examples of it, we can understand it better as a cluster. In this example, you'll find Camp Nou in Barcelona, known for being the largest soccer stadium in the world and seating almost 100,000 people. We have Bernabeu Stadium, which we had mapped earlier. We have Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow, where the last World Cup final was played. Uh, we have Stade de France, which is France's largest stadium in Saint Denis. And to add an example closer to, ha closer to home, I included the Estadio Nacional in Lima. Notice how the three middle stadiums have the same crowd size, while Camp No branches off marking the high range and the Estadio Nacional a lower range. They are all aligned along the x-axis value of permanence since the duration of a soccer match remains unchanged. Another way in which this method of mapping is useful is how it allows for granularity and detail. Um, depending on the type of occupants. After all, a stadium is not just occupied by spectators. You also have to, you also have the actual sports te technical team who probably arrive earlier and stay a little longer than the audience. And the maintenance staff who put in their daily eight hours of work at the stadium, regardless of whether there's a match or not. While crowd size and permanence are helpful for illustrating occupancy, we can also play around with other equally relevant categories. One could be crowd size versus frequency meaning how often the building will be occupied. Notice how our three building points get rearranged on the map, with the movie theater having the highest frequency value, since going to the movies is a daily occurrence. The racetrack has a middle value, since racetracks are usually open to the public three or four days a week. And the soccer stadium has a lowest value, since soccer matches are usually scheduled once or twice a week at most. Another alternative could be measuring the crowd size versus schedule, meaning at what time of day does occupancy take place. If our x-axis is now a 24-hour schedule from midnight to the midnight within the same day, you'll see how all three building types are now closer together, given how going to the races, to the stadium, and to the movies are all afternoon activities. Finally, we can compare crowd size versus density, meaning how tightly packed will people be in the building. At a quick glance, we can see how the soccer stadium and the racetracks fall closer together, whereas a drive-in movie theater has a considerably higher area per person. Assuming a couple of people per parking space, the comfort level of the movie theater does not compare to that of the other two. This map could also have complementary data layers, which could prove useful for purposes of pattern recognition. One could be ownership. Do the occupants have designated spaces? This is helpful to make a distinction between, say, a hotel and a cafeteria, or even between an office space with fixed seating and one with hot desks. For the sake of representation, I've marked the soccer stadium uh, I've, marked, I've marked that the soccer stadium has no fixed seating, unlike the drive-in theater, where you have a parking space for yourself. Another data layer could be recurrence. Is it generally the same crowd of people that return to the building? This clearly sets apart a hotel that is open to any guest from an office building that expects the same pool of workers almost daily. In our map, we show that the movie theater is more open to all as compared to the stadium and the racetrack, which tend to have a captive audience. There is one more key component to this mapping system that will be useful to us. 
So far, we're being able to map the current state of occupancy in buildings. But could we use this map this to map the direction in which they are evolving? As with a quantum particle that will only reveal its position or its direction, we could attempt to approximate both. Let's go back one last time to our stadium, to our soccer stadium, and map it according to crowd size and performance and permanence, just as we did at the start. Now let's look at the COVID-19 stadium, which has a spectator cutouts instead of real people. Now I'm not saying this is the future, but I think it's a good indicator of the virtualization of the building type. How could we map this alternative soccer stadium? Well, probably in a coordinate with the same duration of the soccer match, but with a smaller crowd size, now that it's reduced to just the players and technical teams. We can't know for certain right now how small this new occupation would be. Does a stadium need more cameramen? Or on the contrary, is occupancy even smaller? Now that you wouldn't need as many security personnel, food vendors, or a cleanup crew. What we do know is that the arrow is facing downward. That is the evolutionary trajectory for the building type. So now we should be able to map not just our building types in any of the categories we've explored, but also the direction they are likely headed in as topologies evolve. I believe this is a moment to take a healthy break, to let this all sink in, but also to ask you to think of a building type you are familiar with and to do so in terms of occupancy. Literally, take a piece of paper and write down the following. A building type name. How many people occupy the building? How long do they stay there? How many times a week is the space occupied? At what time does occupancy peak? What is the rough density of these, of these occupants? Does the crowd have an assigned space per individual? Is it the same type of people that goes back to the building? Please write this down so we can share it in our Q&As and we can then think together about the direction in which the building type will probably evolve. I'll leave this timer on. Here, I'll stop. Um, I'll leave this timer on, plus the list of questions. Uh, I'll see you in 15 minutes.
Welcome back. Having had the time to ponder this subject, we'll now jump into the work that there you go, that we started uh, that we started uh, doing to actually map this information. So this was our first attempt to make a graph. The x-axis, which you'll recall is permanence, has regularly shaped units marking the 24 hours in a day. This would give us a range that could map flash occupancy, like a Japanese photo booth where you go in and out, all the way to a full day retreat. It left open the question about how to map spaces with longer occupancies, such as prisons. For the time being, we're leaving that as beyond 24 hours. On the y-axis, we still have the crowd size. Because we need to show crowds at completely different scales, from say the retail changing room that fits one, all the way to the 100,000 people at Camp No, we applied a logarithmic scale to fit, to fit it all in. In this graph, you'll see the point mapping Bernabeu Stadium, surrounded by a locus of points uh, showing the higher and lower ranges of a soccer stadium's capacity, as well as a range of staying times. This is where we factor in whether the match goes into overtime or not. So this is our locus of what occupancy could look like in a high profile soccer stadium. We then moved on to different building types. We mapped corporate buildings using as examples the extinct World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Virginia, both with rather high occupancies versus the Burj Khalifa, where occupancy is lower, but the workday is longer. We mapped theme parks using as examples Disney World and Disneyland as a challenge to understand how long people stay in these parks. We mapped restaurants using as an example the now extinct El Bulli where crowd size was small but permanence long if you wanted to save your meal versus the largest McDonald's in the world where crowd size is large but permanence is very brief. And just to prove the flexibility of this method, we also moved, mapped transoceanic air flights with a center point on a Los Angeles-Singapore trip that has a defined crowd size and permanence. We estimated that this last case would disclose aspects of the commercial proportions of air travel, as in what is a commercially viable crowd size of a transatlantic flight. flight. If one was to design a commercial aircraft for half that size, would it still be viable? How would an aircraft twice as big affect the duration of the flight, and hence that of crowd permanence? With just these few examples, let's look at evolutionary patterns. We had already established that soccer stadiums would maintain permanence, but decrease, decrease in crowd size. The actual occupancy of corporate buildings has been overall reduced to 50% plus minus 10% of, of what it originally had, according to different real estate reports showing just how immediate these projections are. Its crowd size is reduced, and so is its permanence. Theme parks follow a similar pattern. Even though Disney World reopened mid-pandemic, and in Florida of all places, crowd size was forcibly decreased, though not as much as permanence. After all, if you're already taking the risk of going to an amusement park, you might as well spend the day there. Restaurants have already evolved, with dine-ins, uh, dine-in areas being either emptied out or with their tables half removed. The time to eat a meal will be the same, but crowd size is greatly reduced. And finally, on a disappointing note, to date, U.S. airlines have not been forced to reduce the occupancy of their aircrafts, meaning flights have the same crowd size and permanence as before unless people willingly choose not to travel. This is a category that, for comparison's sake, could remain static and unchanged in the future. 
This has been a rundown of the ideas that comprise the Occupancy Manifesto. We hope this collection of ideas and insights will contribute to the, repos the repositioning of occupancy as a key metric for not just architects, but for anyone wishing to measure space, especially through a pandemic, to anticipate the evolutionary patterns these buildings will follow, to foresee these evolutionary trajectories and feed the conversation of how our buildings will be like in the future. To encourage architects, as well as architecture schools, to reconnect with user experience and reflect on the role of form. And finally, to empower architects to engage in the development of codes and regulations that will dictate the form of the next generation of buildings. I thank you all for your time and will be glad to reconnect as we discuss your questions and to review the data on building types that you may have come up with during our break.